warm, warm welcome, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Gaia Journey, to our ninth uh, week, our ninth session together. Um, we are just so pleased to be here together um, and just to see all of the comments coming in with everyone wishing their hellos and um, and their places and spaces in the Zoom chats and in the YouTube comments. Uh, my name is Antoinette. I'm one of the hosts of Gaia Journey, along with a very incredible team, including 130 in our in our global team um, together. And I'm here joined with Otto Sharma and Peter Senge, who will be uh, guiding us through the session as well in just a little bit. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, I have the great pleasure of sharing a little bit of where you've been. So whether you've been with us before in this 14 week journey, um, or you are just joining for the first time, um, I can share a little bit about where we've been and where we are hoping to go. Um, although we don't necessarily know, I don't know about for all of you, but for, um, for me, it's felt like uh, kind of every day is a new, <laughs> very new day. Um, and each week, something new is happening. And um, it may be a lot to keep up with. And there may be a lot um, that we are just figuring out how to settle into each day um, and become aware of. And that's really what we're doing here together. Um, so I'll invite us in a little bit through the journey and um, share a little bit about where we have been and where we are going. Um, here we go. Um, okay. From the back end, it is not allowing me to screen share, but uh, hopefully someone has it. Maybe now it's working. Okay. So, Gaia Journey, this is where we are. Um, we have been each week moving through a collective inhale and exhale. So um, really in part, the inhale and exhale is to allow us to kind of just be able to settle into the breath, settle into the rhythm of being in ourselves and being in community. Um, but it's also a place where we've been able to have these cross cultural cross across all of these sort of worldwide potential boundaries um, of nations, et cetera, um, but really coming together to cross pollinate and learn together. Um, each inhale, we've had about 7,000 people join. So in your, your current Zoom room, you may have somewhere between 200 to 300 people. Um, and we also have you on YouTube. So in all of these different places and spaces, we have uh, over a thousand-ish people gathering during each session um, on just our first day. So we've had 7,000, or just our first session. And throughout the day, um, we hold multiple sessions, three in English, one in Spanish, one in Portuguese, and multiple other languages have been popping up. So 7,000 people in over 70 countries and over seven languages have been um, really just pushing um, to come together and really join in this collective conversation. This process of inhale and exhale, you can see a little bit more here, kind of moving from the world that may feel like it's collapsing in some ways um, and just stepping into the world that's wanting to be born. So that's our inhale, exhale journey. And in this next piece is the layer of, many of us have been gathering in social solidarity circles. So each week we've been moving through, we started on March 27th and moved through um, May 8th. And now we are here on what I believe is May 22nd. I lose track of the days sometimes. But the um, reality of where we are is we're moving through this journey together, uh, moving through this experience of being together in social solidarity, even when we are being forced in some ways to physically distance ourselves from each other. We'll continue on this journey up through a global forum on July 10th and 11th. So we have two more inhale sessions. We'll do um, some continued conversations during the exhale in our own places and spaces. And we'll come back together on July 10th and 11th for the global forum. 
each of these moments have been kind of segmented into three parts, kind of almost like a semester experience. But in the first part of what looks kind of like a U shape is the staying with. So it, we started with uh, deep listening and dialogue. We dropped in in the last few weeks to deep resonance and connecting to source. And now you can see where we are is actually moving into this kind of moving with and vertical social prototyping. So we're starting to lift out carefully from, from this deep resonance place, continuing to keep that connection to source, but moving into a vertical, pro, uh, vertical prototyping experience. What's required here is a shift of the paradigms that we've known in the past and a movement forward into a new paradigm, um, which is why we have connected here with our um, wonderful guests who are joining us throughout to the day, Peter Senge uh, this morning and Friedolf Kapra this afternoon, um, depending on where you are in time zones and Julia Kim um, for the English sessions. We'll also have Umberto Maturana and Jimena um, who are joining us in the Spanish session. So we have a lot of really wonderful guests who are gonna be actually holding us through this paradigm shift, through this moment of um, really, how do we step into our new possibilities? How do we step into um, seeing and sensing from the whole, not just from our own individual place? So um, we've been doing this through a number of different practices and we've had really wonderful speakers who have shared um, with us throughout the Gaia journey. Um, and just some reminders for those of you, especially who haven't been with us, um, we have an essentials section on the GaiaJourney.org website where you can fully catch up. But some of the, um, the little reminders are that <clears throat> when we started this journey, we really sat with this experience of everything I have gone through in my life has prepared me for this moment. So whether it feels like something, you know, is just wanting to be born, that's really where we're coming from. Um, we had Vandana Shiva join us who explored the new colonization is the colonization of the mind. We had Dana Cunningham who reminded us that structural violence is a set of human agreements. And we heard from Noel Nanup from the Aboriginal elders and leaders in Western Australia, who reminded us that the piece of the path to the future is something that we're already standing on and can move through together. We started to explore, okay, this is wonderful, but how do we actually do this? And that's where we started to move into the social arts and uh, exploring social presencing theater with Arwana. Um, really sensing into the body. What is an embodied experience? Not just moving in the mind, but really what's, what's the actual step that I need to take? Um, and what's the micro change? What's the small place within myself where something is already starting to shift? Last week or last two weeks ago, we heard from Thomas Hubel who reminded us that often we kind of put out a part of ourselves when we experience a crisis or trauma and that becomes our past. And we have to start to um, notice that and accept that that's what we've been doing. And then perhaps we can move towards wholeness or integration. We heard from Nipun Mehta who helped to support us to open our hearts to compassion and to compassionate action um, and really moving with kindness and, um, and connecting us back to the spirit of Gandhi. We um, also heard from in the Spanish and Portuguese tracks, a couple of a few different interesting voices. Alejandro Corks um, shared with us what you like and what you don't. They both hold a marvelous secret to one's freedom. And we heard from U Ubirachi Pataksho that we need to be the system. And finally, we heard from John Kabat-Zinn who reminded us to fully wake up, that when we are just beginning that process of opening our eyes and, and coming back into the world, either from sleep or somewhere else, that there's a real possibility for us to go just a little bit deeper, to sense into an even more heightened awareness um, and really fully wake up. And these are all of the places that we have to actually step into awareness-based action, which Otto has reminded us about. Um, and that is where we begin to shift our paradigm today. 
And for further framing and a deepened exploration, I send it over to Otto. Thank you, uh, Antoinette, and um, hello, uh, everyone, and also a special warm welcome to, uh, to Peter. Um, before we move into the uh, check-in conversation, a little kind of uh, connecting with uh, the experience yet that you have had uh, over the past couple of weeks, uh, I wanted to just um, add um, uh, two or three uh, footnotes to uh, the framing that uh, Antoinette just uh, shared with us. And um, so from a methodological point of view, we have been, what we've been trying over the past few weeks, and some of you may have joined kind of uh, very recently this week, or some of you may have been with us uh, all the way along, leaning into the current moment. That's really kind of what uh, we are uh, trying to do, leaning into the current moment uh, with our mind and heart wide open. So that's what we are trying to do. And as you know, kind of for, for the first few weeks, we focused on the left-hand side, right? On seeing and sensing and staying with. And with this session, we'll be moving more towards um, what you see here on the right-hand side, crystallizing, crystallizing vision and intention, crystallizing what it actually is that we want to, uh, uh, you know, that we want to manifest. And um, as um, as you all know, um, you know the the current situation is really shaped by two main responses that we see playing out right amongst us, and you know also on the larger scale. And the one response you see depicted here on the lower half of the screen, which is what. Um, Nipun and also John Kabat-Zinn talked about last time, which is awareness-based compassionate action. So that's kind of, we see, you know, that's maybe the most significant phenomenon with, that we see across our planet, right? The outpouring of this compassionate, you know, awareness-based compassionate action on all levels of scale. But then, as Thomas reminded us uh, in the last session, we also kind of have this other reaction, right? That is not uh, shaped by opening the mind-heart will, but by a freeze reaction of the human mind. And which really results in denial, which is not seeing. Or, as he reminded us, right? Or desensing, which is not feeling. So when I'm overwhelmed, as Thomas explained to us, and I'm kind of splitting off a part of myself that I'm numbing, then I move into this not seeing and not feeling. And, you know, it continues with disconnecting with our highest future possibility, absencing, and then resulting into blaming others, violence. Remember Dana talking to us about the various forms of structural violence and eventually in self-destruction. So what we see here is that whether a system is responding to a situation like COVID-19 uh, from an inner place that is grounded on this lower half or an inner place that is grounded uh, in this upper half, that makes all the difference, right? And in the case of the United States, the difference is 100,000. So we'll reach that set milestone, probably on Monday, 100,000 deaths connected to COVID-19. Um, if the lockdown would have started two weeks earlier, we probably would have saved 50,000 lives. So that's uh, the level, the impact. So this inner place that we operate from, from the level of awakeness that we operate from, uh, has real-world consequences. And uh, from an from the viewpoint of awareness-based systems change, we can say that experience is not what happens to us. Experience is what we do with what happens to us. So whether we respond to a situation based on the lower half, the opening, or the closing of the mind, heart, and will. In the same way, we can say that future is not 
what happens to us. The future uh, is what we do with what happens to us. So that's kind of what the future is uh, arising from. So the question is, how can we strengthen our capacity on this lower half, both on the level of the individual, but also on the level of the collective? And that's what brings us together here in the Gaia journey. And in, in terms of the collective response, so how can we you know, strengthen collectively respond kind of from you know, this lower level? I think uh, what we are leaning into in our journey forward is uh, different types of what uh, Peter years ago uh, referred to as innovations and infrastructures. And the three types that we see beginning to emerge is in, in terms of learning, in terms of democracy, and in terms of the economy. So innovations and learning infrastructures really is about whole person, whole systems learning, right? Kind of what we try to do here, integrating head, heart, and hand and the whole system. Uh, innovations in democratic infrastructures is really about making democracy more participatory, uh, which means kind of more direct distributed dialogic. And um, innovations in economic infrastructures is really about shifting the paradigm the logic, the fundamental logic, how we organize the economy from ecosystem awareness to ecosystem awareness, by which we mean an awareness that is focusing on the well-being of all. So that's uh, a little bit the, the backdrop of this conversation um, and this process we are in here together. And with that, I am... Um, Turn it back to you, Antoinette, to lead us into the check-in groups. Thank you, Otto. Um, incredible. So what we will do is um, move into breakouts. So before we have a dialogue with Peter, um, we would really love to hear from each of you, what has your experience been like? So um, you'll move into small groups if you're in Zoom. If you're in YouTube, you can journal and share uh, in the comments. And when you move into your breakouts in Zoom, you're going to share your name and where you're coming from. And we talked a little bit about what new organ of perception has been opening for you in the last few weeks. So I talked about the micro shift that's happening inside of us. So what new organ of perception has been opening for you in the last few weeks? And what intention is beginning to clarify for you? So you may have had an original intention nine weeks ago. You may have even had an original intention when you decided to click the link for today. Um, Either way, what intention is beginning to clarify for you now? Um, so you'll move into your breakouts. These questions should be in the chat um, in your room. And if you're on YouTube, you can uh, journal and share with us in the comments um, and um, enjoy your time together. We'll see you back here in just about 10 minutes. So enjoy.
our voices and um, and see each other's um, thinking. So you can share in the chat, what is your new intention um, or what is a new organ of perception that's opening for you? So feel free to jump into the chat and share with each other. Dahlia is kicking us off in here um, with my Being more clear about my place as part of the system. That one's from Raina on YouTube.
Ah. For those of you who have not been in a breakout yet, the um, those of us who have been are just coming back now. So we'll all be together again in just a few moments. So again, um, a few more comments from here. The need for a new normal of nonviolence in everything came up. An intention to nurture the permission I give myself, even when I don't feel it in the world around me. And another one here, acceptance of uncertainty and figuring out what we need as human connected to others and our environment, feeling more responsible for my thoughts and actions. Interdependence is part of my life, question mark. A lot of um, the organ opening up is the heart. So if you're just coming back with us, um, we hope that you had a wonderful breakout. Um, we know that people are still rolling back in. Some of us were not able to be in breakouts um, and we spent our time journaling and reflecting and then sharing with each other in, in the chat. So we'll just wait a few more seconds to make sure everybody's back. Wonderful, I think we are all back together again. So we'd love to hear a few voices from and harvest um, really from all of us. Um, we have four different Zoom rooms. So two Zoom rooms were able to move into breakout rooms and due to some kind of Zoomy glitch, we, um, some of us had to, um, or had the pleasure to spend some more time reflecting on our own and, um, and sharing in the chat. So now that we can hear from each other live, um, feel free to, if you didn't yet, put your, um, some thoughts into the chat in channel three and four. Um, if you're in that Zoom room. And um, regardless, you can go down to the bottom of your screen, click on participants. There will be a little blue hand on the right hand side of your screen. And if you would like to share with us, um, you can click on that blue hand and we will bring um, your voice in um, over all four Zoom rooms. So you can share with our entire audience, which has about 300 people in each room. So, Oh, and also with our YouTubers who um, were journaling and sharing on their own. So we've got channel two, Herman, Herman Funk. There we go, Herman Funk. That's quite correct, yeah. Um, reflecting on your question with regards to new organs of, um, of perception, I can't claim that there is a new organ of perception, but there is definitely a heightened awareness of the situation and what uh, surrounds me. And the same uh, or similar experience is with regards to um, intention. There are no new intentions that, that start uh, to clarify, but again, the intensity of these intentions because of the situation we are in has increased. Thank you. Thank you so much, Herman. Next up is Natalie in channel three, Natalie. Uh, I, I'm muted, okay. Hi everyone. Um, so in our group, we, we discussed about this, this kind of new organ of perception as, as trusting our something that is unclear to us it can be a sensation, a feeling, an, an intuition, and, and that we are not used to trust this place and, and to give it credit because we used to deny this, this place. And, uh, and, and someone else said that 
it's a place that we don't have words for because it's just being born. And what was beautiful is that as a group, as a collective in our discussion through the resonance from each other, we slowly, slowly try to understand this, this feeling we had, also this feeling of knowing each other. Um, so trust the intention of, of trusting this place of sensation of experience, even if we don't know what it is. And, 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 and it was quite amazing to feel that together. incredibly powerful that feeling of having known each other um, and, and knowing each other by that sensation thank you um, we've got Feroz here in uh, channel one here you go Feroz you're up you would have to unmute yourself Feroz Feroz, if you can hear us, there you go. We see you. You have to unmute yourself. There okay, you good. go. Yeah. Thank you. So um, <clears throat> one of the new organs of perception that I've been um, discovering, unraveling, and it's very exciting is listening. So first I began the discovery with how I personally listen. So there's a way when I go to a client meeting or my family meeting or a Zoom call, there is already a listening that is there that I am not aware of. And when I begin to get aware of, it's amazing. It shaped how I listened, how I responded, what got in, what didn't get in, my actions and the results. Um, and it was truly uh, breathtaking and amazing. And then I began to get uh, present to there is a listening for humanity. Um, and that brought in a whole new connection to the world, a real connection and a capacity to allow for the, what I call as good and bad. All of that began to be available and the main thing I want to communicate my relationship to all of that is I begin to at least experience some sort of an ownership mm. of what's happening in the world so that's it thank you thank you Faroz thank you so much um, we'll hear from one more voice uh, Mercedes over to you Yes, thank you. Uh, we're talking about like uh, sensing more people, the collective, being more aware of how other people are feeling. And so the intention is to listen to the silences, people who don't have voices. So that was something that we most of us share and how to that in many cases, sometimes diversity is creating divide and, and the intention is how to help actually diversity be uh, a source of wealth and a new way of going forward. Thank you so much, Mercedes. Thank you all for uh, participating, for sharing, um, and for just beginning this session's conversation, um, kicking it off. And now um, to, to deepen our dialogue together, um, I'll send it back to Otto and Peter. Thank you. So um, it's really uh, my pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce uh, uh, Peter to you all. Peter doesn't really need an introduction uh, he has been at the uh, forefront of um, systems change, organizational learning, and uh, cultural learning, and also leadership for many, many uh, years, uh, and really uh, co-inspiring the whole movement um, that we now see more and more um, manifest, and that we all are uh, being part of. So, Peter, it's... Um, it's a great um, pleasure to uh, have you uh, join this conversation. 
And in terms of the co-inspiring, I mean, I am actually an example of that, right? I, I read the book, uh, your book, The Fifth Discipline, back then in Germany, and that was what prompted me to come to, uh, to Boston uh, to join the MIT Learning Center um, some, um, I don't know, what is it, uh, 25 years back or something like that, how to believe. And um, so before, uh, and I, I, I still... Um, remember peter so early kind of it must have been in the first or, or second year when we had our first real in-depth conversation it was a conversation that actually changed my life and uh, because you talked about systems change in a way i haven't heard before and in a way that really that awakened really a new organ of perception within me it awakened a question that ever since has been present with me every moment. And um, so when we started the conversation, I don't know whether you remember that, Peter, but um, uh, it was, uh, you just, I think you just had uh, returned uh, from a trip uh, from Hong Kong to China, uh, multiple places in East Asia, and your last stop was in Hong Kong. And you talked, you had a meeting there with a very special person. So um, I don't know whether you, uh, and then from that kind of you, you went on to really uh, framing the essence of systems thinking in a way that is really at the very heart of what we uh, just heard everyone sharing about. So a uh, very warm welcome, Peter. And so maybe the first question is any resonance you have on what you just heard, kind of the community sharing here. And then the second question would be, to invite you to maybe share a little bit with the group. So what was the trip back then about? And and also maybe kind of taking us back to this um, moment where you articulated the essence of, of, of systems thinking in a way that I believe is very much connected to the current moment. Peter. Well, uh, thank you very much, Otto. Uh, it's, well, of course, I'll, I'll just say the obvious. It's a real pleasure. Uh, not just to be here, but to watch how this whole process has unfolded when all that when Otto takes us back to getting to know each other first. And it's a long time ago, uh, but it, it kind of also is a great kind of awakening to this river we've been part of. We've been swimming in for a long time, and I think the we is a big we. I think it's it's true for for all of us in some ways. It, we just have to suddenly look up and go, oh, wait a second. This is not about me. It's not about my thing. It's not about my little raft that I've got kind of floating down this river. You know, it's about the river and how we try to understand where it's going. There's an old saying in traditional Chinese culture, you cannot move the river. Dig a channel, the river will move itself. So to kind of extend the metaphor a little bit, I think as we sense this kind of river, we kind of look for ways to dig our little channel. And where does that uh, sensing come from has always been a really uh, very central question for all of us. Um, just again, on a kind of mundane level, just to watch how the work of Theory U and presencing has unfolded, to watch one stage after another of this kind of opening to being truly uh, a global conversation involving people from from all over i uh, just have such admiration and and really uh, amazement in a word at how it's developed um i had the good fortune as Otto was referring to to eventually find a teacher i'd been actually looking for a teacher for many years i just felt like i really needed that in my life uh and i just had no plan on having my teacher be on the other side of the planet. So when Otto uh, and I had that conversation he was referring to, I just come back from my first visit to the person who eventually became a teacher for over a decade. Uh, he, he was at that time in Hong Kong, later in uh, outside of Shanghai. His name was Nan Hui Qin. Um, very, very well known within China, very little known outside of China. Uh, I think there's over about 80 books credited to Master Nan in, in Chinese, uh, and probably about a half a dozen that have been translated. 
in into English and to many other different languages as well. So um, there was a couple of things that I think were very present for me even after that first visit. Uh, again, I, I had been looking for a teacher and I'd kind of found it. It was a little bit like the, the Goldilocks story. You know, this bed's a little too small, this bed's a little too big. Uh, and finally I found one that, oh, this is one's about right. I had no idea why. I guess I had a few inklings. Uh, there was something about the, um, uh, the the kind of combination of, of profound intellectual understanding. And given just the kind of person I am, I really couldn't have really found a teacher who didn't have that. Um, I found out later, I didn't know this at the time, that, you know, Master Nan was quite famous in China as the kind of the most... Um, kind of powerful integrator of the Chi of the Chinese great wisdom traditions, the Taoist, which of course is very ancient, um, the Buddhist, which is the most recent, and the Confucian, which as he was trying to point out to people was really a cultivation tradition. In many ways, the Confucian tradition is the closest to what all of us do because it's a cultivation tradition in the context of how our institutions work, our understanding of education, our understanding of business, our understanding of being uh, in a position of authority. These all are situated within the Confucian tradition um, and in turn influenced by the Buddhist and Taoist traditions in very different ways. So that kind of uh, extraordinary intellectual breadth and depth was something that was important to me. But there was one comment made in the check-ins that really also kind of brought me back to something else that probably was a, a need I had that I didn't even know I had. Um, and I'll, I'll describe it best in the Taoist tradition because I think in the in that kind of multifaceted uh, Eastern Asian wisdom traditions, the Taoist comes the closest to this. It was the comment made about beginning to trust before words. It, it's very evident that we are a very verbal culture. We talk a lot. And oftentimes we don't really have much idea why we talk a lot. We talk and we talk and we talk and we talk. Uh, by bringing in social presence in theater, Otto has, has kind of connected us to much older traditions to kind of tap into the wisdom of the body, individually and collectively. Um, and, and that goes very close in the deepest sense to the Taoist tradition. There's a famous line in the, in the Tao Te Ching. Of course, the Tao Te Ching is kind of the uh, iconic representation of the Taoist tradition, but you must remember that Lao Tzu, in writing the Tao Te Ching, continually kept referring to the ancients. So in many ways, Taoism is what has passed along through the last few thousand years of the indigenous or native knowledge of the Eastern Asian cultures. And not surprisingly, it's a knowledge that's deeply connected to the physical reality, to nature, to our existence as embodied sentience, way, way, way before we're verbal sentience. You know, we just look at the development of the infant, right? There's this kind of awareness of self and other in space. And then gradually verbal communication develops much, much later, interestingly, right? I mean, literally one, two, even three years later because it, it's really important and useful, but it, it really is uh, a reflection of this bigger awareness. The line of the Lao, of the Tao Te Ching I was thinking of goes, in the pursuit of gain, every day something is learned. In the pursuit of the Tao, every day something is unlearned. This destruction, and that's, and we think not a bad word to use of what we think we know. This abandonment, this letting go is so central to almost all cultivation traditions. And they ask, well, what's left then? Well, it, what's left is a vast kind of ability to know that is not verbal. So I think it's just fitting that we should be in this highly verbal, over-educated modern world also opening ourselves to all the profound understanding that goes before words. And, and that really was the kind of um, awareness that I was sitting with when I met Otto. And, and then if you start thinking about system change, you think about it in very different ways because you're not thinking starting from concept. You're not thinking starting from theory. You're not thinking starting from a verbalization or an abstraction 
of reality, but you're trying to deal with something that's more pure and more direct. And I think that was exactly the spirit of the conversation Otto and I started to have then. Hmm. And that speaks very much to the to the current moment, right? Another um, another aspect of that I, I, I remember, Peter, is um, so that um, when when you shared about the conversation that you had with him, kind of uh, that you shared with him, you know, all the environmental and social challenges, and so and so while and then noticing that he was. Uh, um, you know, he was shaking his head in disagreement, right? So that he saw it another way and that made you stop and then ask him, so what, what, what do you think about that? And then his response was something around, there's only one issue in the world. That's right. So what, what was the one issue? Well, he used to often chide me. This went on for, for years. You know how teachers, are, part of their job is to give you a tough time. And he always say, Peter Senji, he always say, Peter Senji, Peter Senji, he always wants to save the world. Um, because he knew that, you know, all my life, you know, this kind of social and environmental imbalance has been like the gnawing reality. Um, he said that, you know, yeah, that's all true, of course. Um, and we're entering a very, very difficult time. I mean, he was very clear about that, you know, very, very difficult time. We'll go on for many decades. But the really deep issue is in the words that was translated for me in that first meeting, the reintegration of mind and matter the going so far upstream that this illusion of our perception that there's something out there and there's something in here, there's this mind thing over here, there's my awareness, and that's completely separate from this imprints out there that are being made in my awareness. There's this external reality. Uh, this is a special day to be part of this program because having both Fritschoff and Humberto in the in the coming sessions is, is really amazing because I don't know any Western scientists who've done a better job of articulating this than Umberto Monterana, who, who has said all along that, you know, this illusion of a separate reality is where our problems all start. And that's hard for us, of course, because as we embrace the pain and suffering of reality, there's a natural tendency. This goes back to Tomas's comments last week. There's a natural tendency when we contact that intense emotion, that trauma, to disassociate to treat it as something outside and not part of me. And an immense kind of developmental dynamic to more and more be able to hold that which is most painful, which emerges in our awareness as separate, as not separate, as, as really part of my own awareness. So this reintegration of mind and matter, which was the way it was expressed way back then, has, as Otto said, really become a touchstone for us all. So reintegration of mind and matter on the on, on, on the level of the, the social whole, right? The whole social system as the essence of uh, systems thinking. Um, and as you said, Thomas, uh, you know, collective trauma, really, that is the embodiment or kind of that is manifesting the disintegration, right? Of, right. of, of these two. Right. Now, you, you know, uh, you, the, the main thrust of your work has not been only focusing on articulating these concepts, but really making them happen, right? As an action researcher, um, making them happen and working with large systems. So if we apply this thought really to uh, not only personal, yes, there is a personal dimension in that, but if we apply it to the whole system, having um, so... You join MIT, uh, you know, and, and out of that institute that you joined back then came, you know, from your colleagues back then, the, the, the Club of Rome studies, the limits to growth, all the way to now. I mean, are we, um, are we making any progress? And is that actually happening? So the reintegration of mind and matter on the level of the whole system, what, we, what actually does that mean? And where, if anywhere, do you see that happening? Or at least small steps into that direction? Mm. Well, obviously, it's taken many, many generations for us to get into the predicament we're in. We're not going to get out of it in one or two. So it just kind of keep helps us be grounded. This is a journey of many decades, not many days or months even. Um, for me, the, the simple way to focus that has always been to pick some key institutions. And, and what would it look and feel like to create a different 
uh, ambiance, a different environment, a different way of working together, a different way of showing up, a different way of talking with one another, all the kind of basics that are the glue of how a school works or how a business works or how a governmental institution works. And so that's been um, the way I've tended to focus it. It's just one way of focusing. You have to do something. When all is said and done, this is another uh, one of Umberto's famous lines, Umberto Monterana, you know, uh, knowledge is not what we know, it's what we do. All knowing is doing, all doing is knowing. So it always comes down to our actions and then the consequences of our actions. So for the last 10 years, I've been really focused on primary and secondary education because I've always felt it's the most upstream institution um, in the sense that it's the only institution and mainstream major institution in modern society that has a time horizon of over 50 years, the lifetime of the children. Uh, business always struggles with balancing the short term and the long term. Our society struggle with balancing the short term and the long term. So I don't think that will struggle will ever make much progress on that struggle until the voice of the children and the voice of the young people is really alive and is really taken as seriously as, as it needs to be. Um, so prior to that, of course, I'd spent a lot of my time working in business. Again, same basic idea. How, what does this look and feel like in practice? Uh, I was really pleased that gradually that evolved quite naturally into what became a sustainability consortium formed in uh, around 99 to 2000, so 20 years ago, small number of businesses who were starting to see social and environmental imbalances as being fundamental to the long-term health of their, their industry and their business. And then, as I say, in the last 10, 15 years, this real gradual shift into primary and secondary education. So I don't know, we all need a practice field. I think it's very simple to me. Uh, all this is great, but this is not the age of individual cultivation. I'll just end it with one statement that Master Nan made to me after about 10 years or so. <laughs> Again, he was always chiding me of my, of my naivete. He said, you cannot solve the problems of collective karma through heroic individuals. Mm -hmm. This is an age of collective cultivation. And I think that has been really a guiding light for Otto and me throughout. You can't collect, cultivate collectively without cultivating individually. So the individual is always subsumed, embedded within that collective. But to just focus on the individual misses the whole point. That's our problems are not created by individual karma, but collective karma. If you use that that kind of framing. So yeah, I, I think that that's that's the call of this time. Peter, I wonder uh, in the light of what you just said. Um, whether you um, might want to uh, take us through a practice kind of where we move from um, reflecting on these issues really to a deeper level of experience and, and maybe from there put us into some um, breakout rooms so mm -hmm. that, where we can maybe share mm -hmm. that experience with each other. Yeah, I, I'm happy to do that. Do Otto, do you think the breakout rooms will work okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so we give it another try. And okay. So Good. If, if, if that should not happen, then we will kind of improvise around that. So it yeah. worked for two of the um, four. Okay, good. So the practice uh, that Otto and I had talked about is very simple. And it kind of goes with this point in this whole Gaia journey that you all are on of uh, crystallizing. There's a wonderful uh, line of Picasso's in which he said, if you could actually trace the evolution of a work of art, of a great work of art, the critical moment comes when the artist sees the vision. Picasso did not use the word vision very often. This is the only time I'm aware he did. From that time onwards, the outer form becomes more and more consistent with the inner image. So that crystallizing process is, is really quite distinct. And he also pointed out that usually it isn't true at the beginning. You know, you're doing a lot of different things. And that's why the U model has been so useful because it kind of opening ourselves and ultimately opening ourselves to the deeper intention that we're part of all precedes in, in a kind of a generic sense, this crystallizing. Crystallizing doesn't happen at the outset, even though you might have some ideas of the vision, it, it really is something that emerges gradually for most of us, most of the time. So we're gonna do a little practice on crystallizing. And um, if you have your journal handy, you'll 
kind of want it. So it will be two parts of this. The first part is just be quiet. And I'll just kind of ask you a few questions to ponder. And then the second part is uh, just an open, uh, free, free, free writing process. And I'll, I'll describe that when we start it. So just take a moment and take a nice deep breath or whatever. Probably deep breath is a pretty good idea. And just kind of get centered, quieting. Just allow yourself to be. Just be where I am. You might even give yourself a moment to imagine the journey that you've been on. Our lives are a journey. And imagine that there's a part of it that's in some ways perhaps the most subtle, becomes clear periodically, but generally kind of sits in the background of our normal awareness. And that's this idea of intention. And imagine this kind of force or energy of intention does not actually come from you. It's the most direct and maybe the most important connection of you to the larger natural or living world. So imagine that this thread of your life that's been guiding you, that's been present, is not from you in the narrow sense of my identity, myself as I would normally define it, my body, my persona, but it's something that's kind of comes from the larger universe that we're part of. But that it shows up or becomes evident or becomes accessible in very idiosyncratic ways. It shows up in each of us. So just imagine that's always been there. It always will be there. It has no place to go. So it's not born and dies. But there are different stages in our personal or our persona journey where we access different facets of it. And that facet is what you could call a vision. So right now, just notice as you consider the extraordinary gift of being alive, of being embodied, and that this underlying intentionality or thread of intention is always there, what part of it is really speaking to you right now? Or maybe even tugging a little bit at your sleeve and asking for your attention. So just take a moment or two. What is that that's now tugging at my sleeve? What's its feeling? What's the impulse? What's its essence? Don't bother trying to verbalize this. Don't even worry if it doesn't come into a particular symbol or concrete image. It might, but don't worry if it doesn't. But just allow yourself to be open to that deep aspect of who you are, that underlying intentionality. It's sort of like inviting a being into your presence. And as you do this, you'll know, uh, notice a certain type of conversation that's starting to unfold. Again, it's not necessarily a conversation with words. You'll start to notice certain elements of awareness. And when the time is right in that conversation, just ask, how right now, in this moment in time, might I best express this intention that's always been part of my life? What symbols, what words, what goals, 
might embody it as it wants to be embodied now. And just notice whatever images, thoughts, or feelings arise. If you have your journal handy, whenever you're ready, you don't need to start off writing. Whenever you're ready, you can take your journal out and just try to capture some of these images or thoughts or feelings that kind of seem to be at this moment starting to crystallize. We're all different in how we do this type of visioning. For some of us, it's actually easiest to start with something very concrete. There could be something you're working on right now, something that you hope to kind of bring into existence in the next three days, two weeks, one month, at least right there. So just keep in mind that this intentionality spans an extraordinary spectrum from the most subtle to the most tangible. And you can start any place. It doesn't really matter. So whenever you're ready, take out your journal and start to kind of capture a little bit of what you write. By the way, as always, journaling is private. So when we put you into a checkout room in a few minutes, you can talk for a bit, but you won't have to share anything specifically that you write down if you don't want to. So don't feel limited. Notice what moves when your hand and your writing implement touches the journal. And we'll give you a couple moments just in silence. So in just a minute or two, you will be put into the breakout rooms. If all goes well, it'll be the same breakout room you were in earlier with the same people. Um, for those of you who are new, the basic process of a check-in is what we'd really recommend. And it basically means each person speaks for maybe a minute or so, then the next and the next and the next, so that you get to hear from each person. But that's more the formal protocol. The real essence of the check-in is the quality of the listening as was expressed beautifully a little while ago. So just notice your heart listening to one another. Notice your genuine regard and genuine curiosity for what the other says. And when it's your time, you can speak for a minute also. Thank you so much, Peter. So we should be moving into breakouts now. Enjoy your time.
Okay, it looks like just a few more seconds. I see the numbers climbing. So for those of you on YouTube, we're, we're just zooming back in right now <laughs> to get our full audience. So we all made it out and we all made it back. It looks like we're just in. I think all rooms are back. Okay, welcome back everybody. That was fun. Um, for those of us who were able to get into breakouts, um, I hope you had a wonderful time. I know that we may have just scratched the surface of this beginning. Um, I see not everybody got a chance to share definitely in channel one. And I know how painful that is. Um, and we must continue these conversations and dialogues. So one way to do that will be in our social solidarity circles. If you haven't created one, you can create one um, and find each other in the um, Gaia Journey space, um, gaiajourney.org. Um, and if you um, also share on social media at hashtag Gaia Journey, um, if on any part of social media, you can just click on hashtag Gaia Journey and continue to find each other. Um, but that said, we would love to hear what did come up. And even if you didn't get to share, um, if there are pieces that you wanna share in the chat, you can start typing that in now. Um, and you can also start using the raise hand function. So participants um, raise hand and um, we will bring in just a few voices um, because we do only have about 12 minutes left. So. So we've got Jamie. Um, Jamie, we're gonna spotlight you. Jenny, Jenny, we're spotlighting you. Hey everyone. Yeah, just wanting to say about the importance of coming to our bodies. We are nature speaking. So this thing about system sensing, it really is not so much about talking about our emotions in my view, but our sensations. We are cellular intelligence. So we are the environment speaking. When we can really tune in to the subtle sense of that, we will feel ourselves on a cellular level, opening and closing. Even to this conversation, even as I speak, we'll feel that different words will drop into us in different ways. So I'm really encouraging that. It's an amazing way to live. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Um, beautiful. So I believe we're going to Victoria next. Hi. Um, so one of the things we ended in our group with, which I thought was very inspiring, was this idea that we are having also to shift our thinking of what we are trying to attain where up to now it seems that humanity as a whole we've been working on these ideas of trying to achieve something a goal uh, a place uh, creating a system you know in a very um sort of physical way and really what we need to do now is create a practice of continuously searching for continued growth and, and this will be endless and it and it will continue um on and on and on and we have to be comfortable with that and in this process of crystallization even a lot of the people in our group were you know still trying to put the finger on it and realizing that you know it's almost something that we will never attain but as long as we're in the practice of noticing what we need to notice in the moment then we will be on the path to achieving what we need to achieve. Thank you, absolutely. Staying on the path. Um, we'll go to Antonio next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, well, what uh, pretty much what is creeping up or what we discussed in the group are a few words like uh, stepping up, uh, I think this, quarantine or this uh, this whole global pandemic has moved us into 
knowing that we don't have to uh, step it up on the future next week, next month, we have to step it up now to start cultivating uh, in the group. That word, it was pretty powerful. And also the word of synchronizing, synchronizing our head and our heart, but synchronizing it slowly, giving it time to synchronize. And at least in my case, and in some, I think it happens too that the, the head much, goes much faster than the heart and the heart is pretty much on the back, <laughs> pretty much dragging out and pretty much. And also the idea of what Peter mentioned of what is trying to uh, enter our sleeve is to integrate, to remember our wholeness as, as we were little kids. So that, that's it. Thank you so much, Antonio. Um, a lot. <laughs> There's a lot going on in our um, in our breakouts and our discussions and in our sort of there's a lot it feels like it's rising up um, in a lot of us. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the next person. Amelia. And this is going to be the last comment. It's me. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Giulio. I'm from I'm from Italy. Um, uh, we I mean, we discuss many things, but I, I didn't have the chance to share. Um, and uh, what I wanted to share was that for me, this quarantine, uh, this quarantine in Italy gave me a sense of um, a deep togetherness, a deep, a deep sense of belonging to something bigger, and also made me lose my intention. So the intention I had before, I completely lost it. And uh, actually is, is, I mean, I'm in betweenness, uh, a situation of seeing some days a very clear light and vision ahead, and some days a uh, complete uselessness in what I'm doing, still keeping my normal routine and my job. And uh, so I'm in this dance between adaptation of what is about to come and being proactive. So trying to do something about what is about to come that is not clear. And so it came this word to me of being patient and, and, and being present and accepting what is happening and even accepting myself that I don't have a clear intention at the moment. So, yeah. Mm, thank you so much um, for sharing that, Julia. There's so much in that that um, may resonate with many of us in this Gaia journey together. Um, I'd like to move us to Olaf um, as we kind of begin to close out our time together today. Olaf has been, um, generatively scribing our experience. So we can take a look um, and hear from you, Olaf, if you have anything you want to share with us before we move into a little visual resonance practice. Um, probably just one thing which came came just in between. In the beginning, there was, I was trying to capture what the voices which came in and somebody said something, started a sentence with it, and then I started here and then something else came up and I went went along, but that was just the start of the sentence. And then you cannot, you can barely see it. And I just painted over it because I thought, okay, that's that's lost that thought. But this is coming back here all the time and I can see it and it's haunting me. So I don't know. So it's probably also, I have to just accept the unknowing and know it has to be there, whatever it is. <laughs> Okay. Powerful. Yeah. So we'll keep your image up, Olaf. Thank you so much for sharing that and just staying with the not knowing um, with the paintbrush so that we can also stay with the not knowing um, in our own worlds. So what we'll invite you to do is make this screen a full screen if you haven't already. And as you look at this full screen, we'll just sit with this for a moment um, and just notice what you're seeing what you're sensing and what you're feeling. We'll sit just in silence together for a moment being with this image.
And as you sit with this seeing, sensing, and feeling, you can use the prompt, I see, I sense, or I feel, either one of those three, and type into the chat, I see, I sense, or I feel. And uh, one of our hosts will read out a few uh, from each channel. Um, so one of our hosts will read out a few of, from each channel. So I see, I sense, or I feel. I sense a journey of reconciliation. I see a spine rising. I sense a melting of defense of self into the commons. I see the starting place. I see a path opening. I see an opening eye. I feel the tagging heart. I see uh, heart center. I see a wave. I feel blocked. I see new beginnings. I see a gap between a fearful past and the emerging future. Thank you, everybody. That was absolutely beautiful i'd like to turn it over to um, peter and otto um, for some final words before we close thank you olaf as well maybe uh, to teeing it up for you uh, peter uh, what um, one uh, line that i saw in the chat was i sense collective karma mm. And um, I noticed in the comments, um, uh, the sharing, that several of you uh, shared about uh, that the intention, uh, maybe it's not there, or the, it's a process of letting go of the old one. The old is maybe gone, the new is not there. So it takes a while. And I really want to underline that and appreciate that. It's not crystallizing. It's not we do one day and then we move on. So we, <laughs> we constantly do it. And Peter, I, I'm reminded of back then in the early days when we did the uh, 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 the theory you and uh, research with Brian Arthur and uh, other colleagues. So I remember Brian Arthur who really emphasized the power of intention, kind of uh, the importance of the practice Peter, um, Peter did with us. I asked him, so the power of intention, uh, so intention is, is, is really an important force, uh, right? So I, so that's, I asked him, and he responded, uh, no, it's not an important force. It's the only force. So, so the critical dimension of this deeper work to really clarifying our uh, intention, which in part is individual and in part is collective, which has a lot to do with sensing, and that will keep going on. That's why we need each other. And that's, sure. um, Peter, yeah. why also my, my gratitude on behalf of our group is, is going to you. And hopefully this is the beginning that will continue in many ways. Yeah, the, uh, the dance metaphor that came up earlier as you're talking there, Otto, it just struck me that at some level the dance is very simple. It's between kind of complete divergence, you know, that kind of opening, 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 and then opening again and then the convergence you know vision is crystallization at some level it's a converging um, and so really kind of embracing that dance 
as opposed to grabbing on to one or the other as there is to as if they were two poles. One will naturally be more comfortable and maybe at different times than the other. One's more uncomfortable. So, but to really hold the Danva diverging and the converging, I, I want to leave you all with one small thing you might enjoy. Sometime uh, just Google um, Death of a Matador. It's the very famous Picasso painting. Since I made the reference to him before, maybe it's a good way to end. And I have no idea how somebody literally photographed the painting while it was in process. And you'll see this extraordinary process of the diverging, converging, as it is when it starts, or bears almost no resemblance to the way it is at the end. And it leaves me kind of whimsically with, and of course it does have an end, which is the version of the death of a matador that we all know. But I, I guess whimsically it leaves me with this question, well, was it really the end or did he just stop? <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Otto. Um, and thank you everybody um, in the Zoom rooms and YouTube um, for this incredible session that we've just had. Um, it's such a powerful experience um, and Peter for guiding us through um, the reminders of unlearning um, and really staying with our own journey, our own experience. It's okay to not know um, as we step through this and that it is um, more than just our individual experience. Um, so for each of us who has maybe felt, I didn't get to share, I didn't get to, we are also in this together. We are in this experience. Um, and Jenny shared that we are, I think it was Jenny shared that we are feeling this connection um, and sensing what is happening, what is unfolding um, together. So as we move through this journey and through this experience, we have more sessions today. You are welcome to continue to join us um, there. And um, we'll also be sending out continued information um, that can will invite you into hubs and social solidarity circles if you aren't already. Hopefully you've gotten to connect. I saw people sharing emails. Maybe you were in private chats and connecting with each other there. Um, we will continue to do that um, throughout the next few weeks of our journey. Um, and you can stay in touch with us by just signing on to um, the email list there on the GaiaJourney.org, just if you haven't already, um, where we'll continue to send you more um, process and tools around social arts. Um, and as we do this, one of the most important things is this shift, this move from ego to ego, this move towards the collective. So as you look for hubs, um, as you look for a topic that you're interested in on GaiaJourney.org, really looking, um, maybe you have an idea and maybe that is already living. Um, so maybe consider join, um, creating your own hub and also collaborate with one another, finding ways to join across um, of different fields. So again, thank you all, everybody. We'll see you again. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Otto. Thank you, Ola. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, and we will see you um, in the next sessions and in the coming weeks. Take care, everybody. And you can all unmute and say goodbye. <laughs>